person. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so would uh, so would uh, so would I say that about Gopal Rai? Uh, he's a dynamic. Uh, I would say, whole and soul of IAB, more or less. He is the engine for our Institute of Bridge Engineers. Dynamic man. Has at a very young age established himself in repair rehabilitation as a contractor and consultant. Has projects all over the country, and that's the kind of background he has. A very uh, 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 you know, our more or less like a secretary general for us, uh, driving us to improve all the time. So that's okay. my young friend. He's all the energy, you know. He's Mr. Energy. Okay, now. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> uh, and then uh, I would introduce uh, uh, the others who are with us. Uh, let me just see if uh, Swapnil Joshi, who's our Hi. main person, one of the founders of the new group of this, and Mr. Vishal Tombre. Jyoti Bushari, all these are members of our executive committee or our founding body. Uh, I would say our recent founding body of, of maybe a year old, an executive committee of a year old. So this is a brief. Uh, we will go like this. First, I will give some opening remarks. And then uh, I will introduce our president, Mr. Vinay Gupta. All this will take about five minutes. Okay. Then Vinay might introduce me and speak about the IIBE. Mr. Hegde, welcome. Abijo, you might recognize Mr. Hegde from IABSC. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. and uh, also, um, Mr. Mish. Yeah, and, and then uh, Vinay will talk about IAB and activities and what we are. are, are, uh, are Harsha, a small change, I thought. Yeah, bolo. Uh, see, what I'll do, I'll welcome the participants. Okay. Uh, tell about uh, a few words about IAB and then I'll introduce you. Yeah, okay. And then uh, give the floor fair, to you. Fair, fair enough. So it makes a sequence. Okay. Otherwise, if you start and and go back and forth, a problem to, okay. to you, for you. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I will just open and invite you. Yeah. To welcome everyone. Yeah. Or Sapnil, you want to do the welcome? Oh, so no, the this format is also okay. We can try the new thing what you have suggested. That is mm. fine. That is a good thing. No, this is because there was uh, no uh, mention and only yeah, mentioned yeah. Dr. Ashavardhan to welcome. Yes. But yes. then the slot about uh, uh, introducing him is not coming, which had to yeah. be by me. So I must come yes. on the screen only once. That's better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Fair yeah. enough. Okay. So okay, why okay. need to introduce? Uh, uh, sorry, welcome, um, uh, Swapnil. I did. I did. welcome Swapnil. Oh, you meet in the event. You want no, to... I'm asking yeah. Swapnil that uh -huh. I need to introduce first. Uh, sorry, uh, not introduce. Welcome first, and then yeah, you can, and then you can call me for yeah for yeah, yeah. yes yes that. yes. So that anyway, Deepika is doing. So that ah, is, is she doing? There was no yeah, mention yeah. in the uh, yeah that I sub. think there's small change. So she is anyways doing that. So what is doing? Uh, what is Deepika doing? She is welcoming. Yeah, she is welcoming everyone officially, okay. and then passing on the uh, forum to you, and then you can take it up from there. All right, all right, and okay. then I'll pass it on to uh, Doctor Ashwa. Ashwa, fine. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, and I afternoon. think uh, whatever may be the situation at 5.05, .05, we can go live. Right. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. General, Ms. Good Mr. afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste, sir. Abhijo, are you here? Ah, bhai, namaste. Yes. 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 You can see. You can understand our greetings. Namaste is the Indian greeting for welcome and respect <laughs> and, you know. Yeah. Hello. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, Mr. Hegade, you should turn the bridge 90 they, degrees so that you see Namaste there. And you don't have to say Namaste. It's automatic. Namaste is <laughs> guaranteed. You can see that. <laughs> namaste. This is the only word I know. India word I know. The only one I know. <laughs> What's the weather like there? What's the weather uh, I, it's today is cloudy, but it's uh, pretty good. It's pretty good. I, I, for the benefit of all our executive committee members, he lives in an exotic place. He can go mm. skiing in a, a couple of hours, and he can go to the beach in maybe about ten minutes from his house, so probably <laughs> on the beach. <laughs> so he surfs and he skis and he teaches and he works. That's his life. <laughs> it's good food. It's good food. Has a lovely life. <laughs> And the town of Bari, it's beautiful. Where he's from, his town, yeah. town of Bari is just yeah. beautiful. Yeah, very beautiful. Yeah, should I broadcast? Uh, 505. 505. Okay. Five minutes. 
I think we can write. Sir, tell something. Hmm. Vinay Gupta, sir. Hmm. Yes, Vote certainly. Off. Yeah, yeah. Tell me. Yes. For the next week, also event, also you can inform to the audience in the beginning. Yes. Or yes. Yes. Thanks. Yes, I think for everyone's information, of course, uh, during the presentation about IIT to uh, the participants, we can project the slide as well. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, because actually in the, in the beginning, a lot of people are there. Yeah, that's right. At the end, both of them uh, But uh, yes, for... Uh, uh, Dr. Fabrizio's information, we are having a lecture next Friday, uh, uh, ah. you know, by an international expert uh, on the topic of bearings, expansion joints, and seismic devices, and a comparison of various kinds of uh, bearings, because that's where people are confused, and seismic devices. Okay. Maybe seismic devices, let's call it. So this presentation is, let me just get the name here. Um, oh, sorry. Is uh, Dr. George, Dr. George M. Wolf. He's from Austria. Oh, okay. Do we have, I think we have made the template, no? Yes, we have prepared. So during uh, when I talk about IC, uh, IBE, at that time we can project it. Yeah. Right, sir. I think, sir, it is now 5.04. Okay. We can mute ourselves all except uh, myself, Vinay. And, uh, yes. Huh. yes sir. And of course, uh, Deepika for the moment. And we'll start after five minutes after broadcast. Yeah, uh, during broadcast, it takes some time for okay. everyone to yes. come in. Yes, okay. two, three minutes. Start, madam, mute us all. Okay. Yes, okay. Broadcast. Yes. Mm, I can see numbers increasing fast. Uh, who will project the next event on the screen? Yeah, okay, it's available to you. Oh, no, it's okay. It's so we'll go back to today's event. Screen. Moment you can minimize. So I think you should go back to the today's event and start. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, who's the Deepika or Ruhi? Uh, please minimize this particular slide now. Deepika, better that you unmute yourself. Yes, sir. Yeah. I think you should start now. Yeah, we're reaching okay. about 100, so yeah. might as well start. Because I think uh, Dr. Fabrizio is also a bit short of time, I heard. 
so let's not waste his time and let's not show him the indian culture of starting everything late and finishing everything late yes sir i'll, I'll begin good evening everyone we welcome you all to the iib lecture series today we have with us dr fabrizio parmisano he'll be speaking on forensic bridge engineering investigation of two case of bridge collapse that, that occurred during renovation work in italy so we welcome him today now i'd like to request uh vanessa to please go ahead and start the session yeah thank you deepika um uh good evening everybody i am vinay gupta and uh, i must tell you that i am really overwhelmed with the response that we have in the tech crazy but people get exhausted but people are still showing their strength integrity and more than that the good platform for knowledge dissemination knowledge sharing uh, a bit about iib as customary iib that is indian institution of bridge engineers was started in 1989 by engineer mc bhide who was uh, the chief engineer then he retired from railways indian railways and he started this uh, professional organization uh, purely working on bridge engineering so that was the beauty of it and that is still is the beauty of it uh, today we have reached a total strength of approximately uh, uh, 7000 members but of course uh, engineer mc bhide is no more amongst us he uh, passed away i think about 2 years ago and well, two and a quarter years ago but then his dream was that the organization must continue his dream must be fulfilled and in the process he had already uh, created a succession plan wherein he uh, asked me to take over he asked uh, uh, i mean of course not directly at that time but later on our director general mr dipte to take over and we have honorary secretary and dr gopal rai and uh, mr sapnil joshi and of course we have more and more uh, active people like uh, deepika singh on one side and uh, ruhi agrawal on the other of course we don't see her in the photograph but uh, i must say that everybody is a very cohesive set of people and we do have this. Uh, before that uh, since it is already 10th lecture if uh, the organizers can uh, project the slide of the 11th lecture which is going to take place next uh, week not friday just a minute i'll take on that <clears throat> uh, yes so dr george wolf of uh, austria will be making a presentation on uh, bridge bearings uh and seismic devices anti seismic devices i think we should uh, modify the topic to say that also because he's going to cover that but for them bearings are everything bearings are doing all the job even anti seismic devices are also bearings that is how they think but uh, for indian context we will have this topic modified so thank you deepika ruhi please uh, minimize this now we have a fantastic and a very appropriate uh, moderator today and this is this is because the topic we have is all about forensic engineering is all about uh, the real case studies of two collapses during renovations in italy which is something that uh, in india people don't like to discuss because there are too many complexities that develop and arguments that develop but indians don't like to discuss but an italian gentleman has come forward dr fabrizio pamisino uh, pamisano and i am grateful to you sir so our moderator today who is also very uh, quite related to the given field that we are talking of is dr harsha vadan subarao dr subarao uh, whatever i know i have known him for the last about 20 over years he is an absolute technocrat very dynamic and i used to think that he was because of his father dr t n subarao but later we realize that yes he was certainly brought in by him to this world but he has his own absolutely own characteristics and very dynamic uh, he is a cmd of a leading firm consumer consultancy he holds phd from imperial college london and he is executive committee member of our ibe he is governing council member of another organization in india called iestructi 
and a vice president of International Association of Bridge and Structural Engineering, the IABSE Zurich. So he has all the credits uh, to himself. He has been involved with the design of a project management consultancy of a number of landmark projects, such as Signature Bridge, where we were also involved along with them uh, in Delhi. Signature Bridge, the Namaste Bridge, what uh, uh, Mr. V. N. Hagade is carrying in his background, that bridge. And of course, uh, Mr. V. N. Hagade was also uh, the, one of the main creators of this bridge, where they constructed the bridge. So we have a very well learned technocrat with us. Uh, thereafter, uh, 4.6 kilometer rail come road bridge in Patna. That's another very interesting project. I have listened to his presentations on this bridge. Bridge number 20 in uh, highest seismic zone of India. Uh, that's seismic zone 5 with a PGA of 36% and uh, spans as big as about 100 over meters and height of the piers as much as about 70 meters. So that bridge is to the credit with, of course, steel structure is to the credit of Dr. Hashwadhan Subarao. And of course, metro, a lot of metros, viaducts, elevated roads, arch and extra doors bridges, ROBs and underpasses, etc. He's also been involved in forensic investigations. That's where he's most appropriate moderator today. Repair and rehabilitation of more than 60 numbers of bridges. That's a good number, including balanced cantilever construction bridges on Kali, Zwari and Borim bridges, apart from Nizamuddin Bridge, Don Bridge, uh, Penthal Nala Bridge. Well, I have not even heard of these, some of these names, but I'm sure they must be really fantastic cantilever construction bridges. Dr. Harshwadhan is a member of IABC task group, TG 5.1, Forensic Structural Engineering and TG 1.5, Performance-Based Design, founded on lessons from bridge failures. So we are discussing a bridge failure uh, 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 of IABSA, of course, and he's a vice chair of its outstanding paper awards committee. So <laughs> you know who to approach for these awards. He's a member of technical committee of IABSA Zurich and chair of its bulletin edit board, a member of FIB Commission of Durability and Service Life Design. Service Life Design is a very new concept. It's coming in you know, all over the world, I must say. He's a member of Highway Research Board of India and serves on several technical and scientific committees of IRC, BIS, FIB, and various international and national bodies. He has over 30 years of rich professional experience, I must call it, and a number of technical papers he has written are far too many. And of course, he's carried out many bridges which are to his credit. So we have a I mean, we have a combination of, you know, higher and higher level technocrats with us. And we have to see how much we can grasp from these guys. So I'll pass on the uh, floor to Dr. Ashwabhadan Subarao to please conduct the entire session. I hope uh, you do this along with please introduce uh, the speaker as well. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks. Uh, it's a delight, uh, Vinay, to be introduced in that fashion. It, it speaks as though I'm some great guy, but... I'm just a, a good bridge engineer and a happy bridge engineer today. To have my friend Fabrizio Palmisano with us, a friend and a colleague. We share some very great times together internationally on our various meetings. And with that in mind, through our IBSC task group in which we both belong, which was started by Robert uh, Ratte, who passed away some recently and is now headed by John Dunterman. Uh, and the body that the task group in the IBSC have 5.1 is internationally renowned, some of the best forensic engineers, including Fabrizio, being in that panel. We serve on many international journals also together, like the Institution of Civil Engineers, uh, Forensic Engineering Journal of the UK, etc. So with that, I thought, why not we take his uh, expertise of collapses, which he has been investigating through his firm, PPV, uh, a PPV in, in Italy, and give us an insight into um, how they go about things there, what lessons we can learn from them. Okay. Forensic engineering is a rather sort of a nascent field in India. It hasn't become a formalized field in the sense we don't have uh, forensic engineers who are uh, uh, you know, uh, accredited forensic engineers in India. It's just uh, 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 an experienced engineer such as Vinay Gupta would go out to investigate bridge failures or Alok Bomik or myself or so, so there is no actual formal role 
of uh, you know a role uh, a, a sort of registration of such engineers especially for bridges in india leave alone for buildings not even for bridges in india so uh, this is the situation and background i thought this topic would be appropriate now fabrizio has been responsible for many structural projects in italy and in 2005 received the fib diploma to young engineers award in the design and construction category i mean he's he has been involved in the vulnerability assessment of many buildings and investigated some of the most important collapses that occurred in Italy in the last 20 years. In 1998, he received from the Italian Ministry of the Interior the Diploma of Merit with medal for his service in the seismic vulnerability assessment of buildings struck by the 1997 Umbria Marche earthquake. Former adjunct professor of structural engineering at the Politecnico di Bari in Italy, He's author of more than 100 articles and one patent on structural engineering, referee of scientific and international journals, and member of the Italian and International Scientific and Technical Committees. He's a fellow of IBC and member, among others, of its task group 5.1 and Foreign Six Structural Engineering. On the European Union side, he was member of the project team CNTC 250 uh, and a subcommittee SC2. Point P3, revision of Eurocode 2 for concrete structures, where he was responsible for the subtask assessment of existing structures. And at present, he is leader of the project team CNTC 215 working group, working group 2.T2, new Eurocode on general rules for the assessment and retrofitting of existing structures. So, Fabrizio, that being a basic introduction to you, we will be calling upon you as you might have already gathered. We will be calling upon you in future events too. So we'll not let you off the hook with this one event. And we will be using your expertise in that uh, domain that you have, that knowledge that you have in future events with IAB and other bodies in India. Thanks for being with us. Uh, and with that uh, brief background, I would like you to introduce a, a little bit about the task group, a little bit about uh, IABSC. And uh, I might say a few words about IABSC. It was started in 1929 and it has weathered since the Second World War and is a truly international body, uh, which uh, uh, has uh, eight members from 87 countries. Uh, it is like a mini United Nations when we all meet. Uh, and uh, it has some of the best bridge engineers for sure in the world, probably the best bridge engineers in the world, whether it's uh, uh, Schleich or whether it is Virlojo or whether it is Mativa or whether it's Combo or who, they all the best bridge engineers in the world belong to this, Jean Muller, they all belong to this institution and have added greatly to this institution. And so have so many structural engineers of different types of structures also in the ABC. Started in 1929, it still binds people like Fabrizio and me together. And we do work through its various task groups and everybody is invited to join. Here I'm speaking as its vice president, no doubt, but everybody is invited to join its task groups or set up their own and contribute to the profession internationally. So with that, Fabrizio, that little aside, I, may I call upon you to start your talk and introduce the group and then go ahead with your talk. Thanks. Okay. Thanks a lot, Asha, for this wide introduction. And uh, thanks uh, the institution of uh, India Institution of, for Bridge Engineers for this invitation. I'm going to share my screen. And yes, this is my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 Okay, uh, I'm, I'm going just quickly to introduce the IABC task group 5.1, Forensic Structural Engineering. Can you expand and it? Uh, can you expand it to the full screen, Fabrizio? Uh, full screen? Uh, it's it's uh, already in the full screen. I, I, can you see the presentation mode or not? No, it's, it's smaller on the screen, actually. Is that, is that okay for everyone? Yeah. And expand. Now it's okay. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. You gotta go back. Go back. Yes. This is not important. Now it's okay. Now increase at the bottom, I think. Increase the slideshow, slideshow symbol at the bottom. Yes, but yeah. just click it. Oh, oh. And now? No, it's become like a narrow band. Uh, okay, just let me. Let... Yeah. Uh... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I think there is a problem with my screen. Just a sec. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. 
no, no, no. I, I, will, I, I will use, I will use maybe the, the PDF, maybe it's better. Just a moment, everyone. Just a little screen uh, sizing. Maybe I use the presentation, the PDF. Yeah. Let's try with this. Okay. There you go, much bigger, much bigger. Can you fill the screen now? But is it small? It's okay now. I think it's, uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Okay, let's use this, this presentation. Okay, let's go. Oh, presentation. Okay, sorry for that. Um, so uh, the IAB Setas Group 5.1 was founded, as Sasha said, in 2011 by Robert Ratai. And now the chair is John Dantman from the United States and the vice chair is Karen Terwell from the Netherlands. Their primary missions are to mitigate structural failures by sharing knowledge of technical human and organization causes of failures and to enhance the improvement of forensic structural practices by sharing knowledge of methods and techniques related to forensic investigations. Uh, some activities, uh, we organize pre-conferences, courses and workshop here. You can see some slides, some pictures taken during some workshops where there are also some active sessions where uh, the participants work on real case studies. And we have organized also conference special session. For example, we organized a, a keynote in 2018 uh, during the uh, IAPS and Nantes uh, Congress just one, about the collapse of the Ponchevera Bridge just one month after the collapse. And we're working also on a questionnaire on forensic engineering practice that will give a general view of what forensic engineering practice is all over the world. Um, I'm going to talk about two case studies that occurred in the last year, in the recent years in, in, uh, in Italy. The first one is relevant to a standard bridge over a motorway in Ancona that causes two fatalities. And the other one is the collapse of, uh, uh, the partial collapse of an important viaduct called the Italia viaduct in the, in the south of Italy that occurred in 2015. Uh, causing uh, one uh, fatalities, uh, killing one worker. And uh, before that, I would like to highlight what is the general, uh, very quickly, what is the uh, criminal procedure in this case for the investigation in Italy? Because when a collapse occurred in Italy, uh, always, uh, since in Italy, a collapse is always a crime, even if there are no casualties or fatalities, uh, the crime investigation is the first to start, and then there is the civil investigation. So the people responsible for the investigation, for the criminal investigation, are, depending on the case, the consultant, or I say the expert witness of the uh, public prosecutor, or of the judge, depending on the case. This is, means, this is very, I think, peculiar, that the other uh, expert witness involved of the other parties uh, cannot make by uh, themselves uh, uh, measurement, uh, test, etc. But they can take, uh, take part uh, at the investigation, but can only suggest and discuss with the people in charge of the destination what they would like to do. Uh, in the first case, uh, the collapse occurred in Ancona. I was uh, an expert witness for one of the parties. So uh, mainly I'm going to show you uh, the result of some tests, etc., uh, performed by the uh, consultant of the public prosecutor office. Um, while in the second case, I was the consultant of the judge. And this means that I was in charge for the entire investigation. So I will, uh, I'm going to show you the result of my activity together with the other uh, expert from the, for, the, for the judge for the public prosecutor office. Uh, before starting, I would like to say something about the uh, forensic investigation process. Uh, the typical investigation 
a process of arresting the investigation following a failure or a collapse is composed, is mainly composed of this step, a first response and preliminary assessment, then the development of an investigation strategy and fact gathering and document review, the engineering analysis to determine the causes, the cause of the causes and the responsibilities it requests in the final reporting. Uh, the answers that should give, be given for at the end of the investigation, um, citing an important book by Ratai and Peraza in 2013, are mainly are the status of the construction at the moment of the collapse, uh, collapse the external laws and internal stresses or forces acting at the moment of the collapse, the capacity of the structure, the place where the collapse was originated, the primary cause and the trigger of, of collapse, the contributive factor to the, uh, to the collapse, and finally, if requested, the people responsible. So in general, in my company, PP Consulting, we follow this general methodology for the investigation of a collapse or of a, of a failure. We start mainly from the historical kinematic reconstruction of the collapse based on questioning, uh, video photographic documentation, visual spectra of, of the ru ruins. Then we start to acquire the technical data that are mainly necessary for the numeric analysis, documents, surveys, inspection. We start to perform some tests, uh, uh, etc. Then we perform the numeric analysis and finally we identify the design and or construction error and we analyze the influence on the collapse uh, dynamics. So let's start with the first case that is the bridge collapse occurred in Ancona in 2017. Ancona is a very beautiful city by the sea in the, in the, center, uh, in the central part of Italy. The, uh, the bridge was a very standard, very simple bridge on an important motorway. It, uh, the project was by Fabrizio de Miranda, who was an, uh, an uh, expert in the, in the 60s and 70s of uh, mainly of steel structures. The construction is uh, of 1970 and the contract was Construzioni Metalliche uh, Finisider. The bridge is composed of uh, three spans. Uh, the, the longest one is uh, 37 meters long, while the others two are about 12 meters, uh, 18 meters long. The central span, the longest one, is composed of uh, two steel girders, while the lateral span are composed of uh, pretension uh, girders. You can see here a plan view of the of the of the bridge and a, a, a view or taken from uh, Google Street View before uh, the collapse. Uh, the the main part, the main girder, steel girder, have a total width of about two uh, two point four meters, while the pretension girder have, has, have a, a width of about one meter and sixty uh, centimeters. Uh, during uh, the uh, in the uh, twenty seventeen, some renovation work started because there was the necessity to strengthen and to retrofit this bridge uh, because of new uh, seismic standard in force at that moment. So in the original uh, uh, project, there was the necessity to uplift this bridge of more than 30 centimeters because of the details of this project. I don't have time to go into, into details. And this uplift was uh, uh, made according to the tender project by some jack. And you can see here the jack that was to be put just above a, um, a, a shoring tower for the steel beams. However, during the construction, the contractor changed this uh, uh, original design and the construction project included the jack again, but included this kind of steel structure, you can see here in, uh, in light blue, that should be fixed by a jack, by some jacket and by some uh, post in installed anchor bolts to the original reinforced concrete column and uh, in order to be fixed for lateral instability. 
And uh, about this column, a uh, jack was to be installed. But the problem of the jack was that the total stroke of this uh, uh, jack was about 15 centimeters, while the total uplift was about 34 centimeters. This is why the designer of the construction project included in the project some step-by-step -step procedure for the total uplift. So they included to put some steel plates underneath the steel girder as temporary support where the jack, in the moment where the jack should be removed in order to put this uh, additional element that you can see in the bottom right hand side of this slide that uh, uh, Usain was to make the steel column longer because of the temporary uplift. You can see here also the final position of the jack. And in the final position, uh, some uh, rings or rings should be added at the top of the jack to fix them before completing the, uh, the concrete beam that you can see connected to the column that you can see here in brown. In, uh, uh, on the 9th of March, 2018, the collapse occurred of the, of the main of the central span and uh, causing the, the, the two casualties. You can see here this uh, at the bottom side, this car, white car, that crashed into the, uh, the span already collapsed. And uh, the collapse occurred where, in the moment where the uh, deck was in its final position. So the, uh, the uplift was completely, but there was a pause in the, in the, in the work because it was lunchtime. Um, you can see here some picture taken of the, uh, after, immediately after the, the collapse. You can see the detail of the, uh, of the columns that were the support, the original support of the of the of the girder, steel girder, and you can see uh, also the uh, concrete uh, beams, uh, pretension pre concrete beams, in their uh, final position with their temporary supports underneath them. Here there is another uh, detail. You can see the steel columns, steel temporary columns uh, here, and here there are some other details. And you can see also that the, the anchor bolts were completely uh, destroyed. There was a complete failure of the anchorage of these post-installed bolts. Uh, bolts. Uh, and here you can see also that the top of the steel column has, uh, under, uh, has undergone a bend due to collapse of the concrete girl. This is a, a survey, the result of a laser scanner survey performed after the collapse, and uh, that clearly showed that uh, the, the deck, the central deck, has, underway, has undergone a uh, lateral and a torsional movement around this vertical axis. You can see in the right hand side that the movement was about five to six meters, while in the left hand side, the, the movement, uh, the translational movement was from two to three uh, meters. Uh, during the inspection, some strange, I can say strange element was detected. And you can see clearly here in the, slide in the picture at the, at the top of this slide, this uh, rubber element in black, this, uh, that were uh, rubber bearings uh, that were not included in uh, neither in the tender project nor in the uh, construction project. And you can see here clearly also in the image at the bottom of this slide, a rubber bearing in black, then you can see in red a jack, and on the other side in gray brown, you can see the original steel bearing of the concrete of the steel girder. So, what are these uh, this elements? Uh, we have discovered that also uh, thanks to this picture that was taken 
taken and discovered from the public authority, from the uh, police, that uh, represent the condition of the bearing, uh, in blue is the bearing of the steel girder, just a few minutes before uh, the collapse and just after the, the final uh, uplift, when the total uplift was about 34, 35 centimeter. And you can see here again, this rubber place that were rubber bearing. And we have discovered that this rubber bearing were taken by the contractor for, uh, from other construction works where, they, uh, where there was the necessity to, to substitute old rubber bearing. And, and they used the contractor, used this rubber place to put just underneath the original steel bearing of the uh, steel uh, girders in as temporary support. So here we see a condition that is completely different from both the condition included in the in the uh, construction project and in the original tender project. In particular, we have this rubber plate underneath the steel bearing of the steel deck, steel girder. We have also these strange steel plates above the jack. And moreover, we have some strange steel element above these steel plates. You can see that this configuration on the right hand side of this slide is completely different from that included in the construction project because in the construction project, we had a, a the jack in this final position with some O-rings above it to block in its, uh, uh, for safety reason to block this position in this final position. Moreover, we have that uh, Underneath this uh, uh, jack, there, there should be a uh, additional steel element in light blue here uh, to compensate the elongation, the uplift of the girder. So to make longer the original uh, steel column. The, uh, uh, this is another comparison between the construction project in the final position and the execution in the final position. You can see that it's completely different. And you can see also that there, was, uh, there wasn't any connection for lateral movement because the, the lateral resistance was only uh, due to the friction between the rubber plates or this additional uh, steel element on, on, the, on the jack. So it was clear immediately at the beginning of the investigation where, where this, uh, uh, when this picture was taken, was found, and when uh, during the inspection, these rubber elements were found, that maybe the cause of this uh, movement, lateral movement, was uh, the uh, low resistance, lateral resistance of this sort, of this merge of elements put underneath the bearings or above the jack. This is why the uh, expert witness of the public prosecutor's office performed some non-standard tests in the laboratory of the University of Ancona. So they investigated the, the lateral strength of these piles, this column of uh, rubber element uh, by applying a vertical load more P, more or less it was similar to the gravitational load acting at the moment of the collapse. And they applied it in two different con uh, uh, configuration. In the first one, there was no eccentricity. And in the second one, there was a low eccentricity of about four centimeters. And then after the application of this uh, vertical load, they applied a lateral, uh, force F up to the collapse. And what they discovered that the uh, lateral strength was very low. In general, was lower, lower or about uh, to, uh, to 20, only 20 kilonewtons. So they conclude after this uh, test that the cause of the collapse was this very low resistance to lateral loading and the main cause was a general lack of resistance to instability of this merge of element 
composed by composed of the rubber uh, bearing and this additional steel element the, uh, the, that uh, were put just above the check. But however, they didn't discover the trigger of the collapse. Uh, according to us, uh, one possibility of the trigger of collapse can be found again in this picture. In fact, in this picture, there is this very strange element above the steel place that are above onto the, the jack. If we lighten a bit, ah, yes, before that, what is this element? Maybe it could be uh, the temporary support similar to the temporary support of uh, put just underneath the uh, pretension uh, concrete elements of the of the lateral spine but in general according to us it's not that because if we lighten this uh, picture a bit we can immediately and clearly see see that this element is a piece of an eye shaped beams so what we perform in our company very simple we perform just very simple calculation buckling calculation of this element uh, consider that we could take uh, the, the, the width of the flange and then uh, we can obtain the width of the, of the web, taking account that this should be a standard I-beam. And what we have discovered that uh, this element has a very low capacity with reference to buckling. So it was not uh, sufficient to bear the total load of the deck during in its final position. So according to us, the trigger of the collapse was the buckling of this uh, uh, piece of I element. This caused also uh, the, the, the start of this lateral moment, uh, movement. And then the, the, there was a progressive collapse during, as said by the uh, expert witness of the public prosecutor due to the total lack of strength due to lateral forces of movement. After this, let's move to the other case that is a bit uh, more complicated and deserved many, many tests and many different uh, calculations to better understand what occurred. This is relevant to the partial collapse of the so-called Italia Viaduct occurred in Laino Castello, Italy in 2015. Uh, the Italia Viaduct is the, in the south of Italy in a region called Calabria, in a very beautiful region. Please come to visit the the, the old south of Italy because it's very nice for uh, cultural heritage, for beaches, uh, food, etc. Uh, I live in the, in, the, in the south of Italy. So the background, let's move to the case study. The background of this, uh, of this uh, uh, viaduct, this was an important, a very important viaduct built in the, in the, um, uh, in the 60s of, of the last century. Uh, the tender project 1974 was by again, Fabrizio de Miranda for the steel deck and by Carlo Cestelli Guidi. Carlo Cestelli Guidi was an important, a very expert uh, design, designer and professor of that period. He was mainly expert in uh, pre-stress and post-station structure, and also with the help of an engineer called uh, Carlo Pellegrino Gra Gallo. It was built between, in the, between 1966 and 1972 by an important contractor called Lodigiani SPA. The construction project was my, by two engineers of uh, the contractor, uh, Bedeschi and Casciati, uh, but they have as a consultant Riccardo Morano. Ricardo Morandi, maybe uh, I think you know, was an important designer of bridges, but not only of bridge of, of main, main important, uh, a lot of important uh, structures. And he was also the design of the bridge that collapsed in 2018 in, uh, in Genoa. But I want to highlight that the causes of collapse are not defects in the original uh, design. So this bridge 
when it was built was the, the first highest bridge in Europe. At the moment, present is the second highest bridge in Europe after the Via do de Milo in France. It is the entire uh, viaduct is about one kilometer long, composed of 19 spans. And uh, there are three span in, uh, in steel, while the other are composed of post tension uh, girders. The longest span is 175 meters. The other uh, steel span are long, uh, are 125 meters long, while the concrete span are about 45 meters long, depending on the, uh, on the span. And um, uh, you can see here a, uh, some slides, some picture of the uh, viaduct before the collapse. At the top right of this uh, slide, you can see the, a section, a transversal section of the concrete deck that was composed of, uh, of uh, four post-tension concrete girders. Uh, the total width was about uh, two meter and, uh, and 40 and 50. Uh, and uh, there was no slab uh, above that. So they were post-tension uh, prefabricated uh, in situ in a prefabrication site near the viaduct. And there, were, there was in the middle between the, the, the flanges of uh, adjacent uh, girder, there was a cast in situ, as you can see in the uh, with the dash line, a cast in situ uh, concrete to connect the, the four girder. Uh, in the top, in the bottom right of this, uh, uh, of this slide, you can see a transversal section of the steel girder. And uh, the total uh, height of this steel girder is from uh, three meter to eight meter and 20 centimeter, depending on, uh, on the section. Here is a, a picture taken a, from the original construction design. And you can see here two uh, cranes that were installed for the construction. And also above the, the canyon, there was, was built a temporary suspended bridge that you can see also here. Uh, here is uh, there are the, the, the faces used to build the, the most difficult part that was the, the steel deck. It, it was a segmental construction made by using the temporary cranes. Here you can see the, the original design and some pictures taken from the moment of the construction of the pylons of the pier. They were all of core and they were uh, reinforced concrete piers. And uh, uh, you can see also here some picture from the construction of the concrete deck and a picture also of the uh, construction of the, the prefabrication site near the uh, the construction site. Here a view a view of the original bridge. Uh, during uh, 2015, from 2015 to uh, 2016, some renovation works occurred. Um, the main aim of these uh, renovation works was to enlarge the deck of the bridge uh, that was uh, uh, composed of two different. Uh, uh, motorways uh, because of new European standard. It was designed to enlarge only the deck of the uh, concrete part of the bridge because it was decided from uh, an architectural or from a cultural heritage point of view to not modify the most important part of this bridge that was the steel part. So the, the works included the total demolition of the concrete deck in order to rebuild uh, this, de this concrete deck the wider that it was they were in the original design. This is a section of the uh, steel deck. And during this renovation work in, uh, on the 2nd of March, 2015, a collapse of one of the motorway, the, 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 of the concrete part, the span number 13 occurred killing one worker that was uh, working above this, uh, this deck. The height of this span was about 
80 meters above, above ground. You can see here are some pictures of the of the of the collapse uh, during because of the collapse, a half of this fan was completely destroyed. So we can see here in the picture only one half of this fan, and you because of the collapse, this fan crashed into the pier, causing this large hole in this whole local pier. Here another picture you can see in the loft uh, in the left uh, bottom in the bottom left of this picture this machine that was the drilling machine used by the worker that was killed in the collapse to make the holes because in the design was included the demolition by explosives so it was necessary to make some holes in the deck to put the explosive. Moreover, you can see in the picture at the top of this slide, some transversal cuts that was made by using an excavator uh, in the flanges of this girder. We will talk in a minute about, uh, uh, about this. In the, in the picture at the bottom right of this slide, you can see uh, from underneath this garden, you can see clearly some sheer cracks in this uh, in this uh, uh, girder because of the collapse. So the the joint between the garden and the column was uh, composed, as you can see in the picture in the top uh, left of this slide. So there was a column above this, there was a cap, and there was the the support of the garden. And above this cap number one, uh, a new and another cap called cap number two in uh, reinforced concrete was uh, was uh, was made to level and to uh, to level the mo the, the motorway. Uh, in the picture at the bottom of the of the, in the pictures at the bottom of the slide, you can see the drilling machine used to make the holes necessary for the explosive. Why? Uh, in the in the picture at the top right of this slide, you can see the uh, excavator uh, used uh, to make the uh, transversal cuts in the girder flanges. So the original uh, design, demolition design, included these holes for explosive but included also these cuts of the girder flanges because according to the side, these cuts was necessary to have a controlled collapse. In fact, during the collapse for the, de for the demolition by using explosive, the, it was supposed that the, the entire span should collapse vert vertically without crashing into into the, the, the piers, as you can see in the picture at the top right of this slide. So this is uh, uh, what we have found during the inspection in the immediately after mort of the, of the collapse by inspecting also other span, not, uh, non, not collapse. You can see at the top of the, at the top right, a picture where the holes are in this final configuration with a, a duct, a plastic duct for uh, the uh, explosive. And also you can see again, these transversal cuts. Moreover, we have found in some cases that in the, in the position of a hole, in general, there were uh, not only one hole, hole, but many holes, as you can see in the picture and the, uh, the bottom right of this uh, slide. What was the reason of that? We have discover, discovered uh, during the investigation. The reason for that was that uh, they used a uh, drilling machine um, that was not intended to make these holes, but uh, uh, this drilling machine is generally used to make holes in the rocks. So this drilling machine has not a, uh, the possibility to stop the drilling operation when, a, for example, a tendon was encountered in this drilling operation. So it was, it was the, the worker using this drilling machine, depending on the 
on the strength of this uh, of the of the during the drilling operation they decide if a tendon was encountered or, or not and we what we have discovered that in some cases some wires of the tendons was cut were cut but during the drilling operation. So when a tendon was encountered during this operation, the worker just moved a bit the drilling machine to make some another hole in the uh, adjacent to the previous one. And in some cases, this operation was uh, repeated many times. For example, in the bottom left uh, picture of this slide, you can see that this operation in the same position was uh, repeated eight times. The first step of the investigation was to make a general survey of, of the site in order to understand what was the general kinematics of the, of the collapse. But we started uh, simultaneously to investigate if uh, an accidental action should, could be the cause of the collapse. So we make a survey, an investigation in database of Italy, mainly with reference to, to accidental action, one is earthquake and one is wind. So we discovered that non -import, not important wind occurred in the two weeks before the collapse. And the same was uh, for earthquakes. We, uh, there were only some very slight earthquake during uh, in the weeks, uh, two weeks before the collapse of a magnitude of about one of uh, slight uh, greater than, than one. Also, by making some survey, also some laser scanner survey, we discover that there was not movement in the, that peers uh, didn't suffer a movement. So there was, uh, there wasn't for sure a problem relevant to the possible movement of the, of the foundation. This is why we focused our investigation to the, uh, onto the deck, mainly onto the deck. And uh, to the same, we perform, we started performing some tests. Uh, at the beginning, we, we wanted to make some tests on the collapse span because there was a, a half span that could be tested. But however, uh, we didn't know if uh, uh, the con concrete, for example, and also steel, there's sometimes some degradation because of the collapse and because of the impact during the collapse. So th this is why we performed also some tests on an inkta span. There was the first one, the span number 19, that you can see on the right hand side of this slide. And it was very simple uh, to perform some tests on this span because uh, it was immediately on, on the ground. And uh, we compare this result with the result of the test uh, perform on the collapse span. And for example, with reference to, to concrete uh, compression test, we realized that there was no difference between the, the characteristic value SCK uh, from the test on the intact span and those from the test of the collapse span. Th this means that we could use the result for our uh, analysis, numerical analysis, the result of the test taken from the uh, collapsed span. We performed the same uh, kind of test from, uh, for the uh, bars. We performed some tests and the comparison between the test of the intact span and the collapsed span from, for, uh, of the bars uh, and also on the, on the wires. We perform also uh, 25 endoscopy tests in the for explosive of the collapse span in order to understand if some wires were cut or uh, in total or par uh, in part by the drilling operation. And uh, we perform some non-standard uh, 20, non-standard detention tests on wires of the intact span. Why? Because if you wanted to understand the strength of a post-tension girder, we need to know the stress acting in the wires, in the tendon. So we could perform for sure some, uh, on the intact span, some uh, um, indirect testing, some uh, uh, such as the crossbow method, but they are indirect testing 
So they are not as reliable as direct testing. So we decided to try to perform such direct testing. So this was the procedure that we use for this, what we call detention test. The detention test was composed by, of these five steps. In the, in the first step, we remove the duct and then we uh, clean the, the, the wire. The wire were composed by uh, seven, seven millimeter uh, uh, bars. And then we put some plates on the, on the bar to be tested and we measure the distance between these plates. Then we cut, as you can see in the step number four, these plates. But what was the problem in this moment, in a moment that in each case, these plates that we have uh, sticked to the, to, the, uh, to the bars were completely dropped away because uh, the, the, after the cut, the, there was a, um, a, a quick uh, uh, re reduction in the, in the length of these bars. So this quick movement caused the, uh, that these plates were dro completely dropped away. So we made some alternative procedure, but none of them worked well. So finally, we decided, as you can see in step number two, to make some very, very small notches uh, in the, but, but very, very small that did not uh, reduce the strength of the bar in the, in the bar itself. And by using this, this procedure, we, we, uh, we were able to complete the, the test. So at the end of this test, we measure the shortening of the bar uh, caused by the cut. Then we took a piece of the bar, so we put in the laboratory and measure uh, the, the young model, the modulus uh, by using a tensile uh, test. By having uh, the young modulus and the shortening of the bar, we can uh, obtain the, the stress acting at the moment, at that moment on the bar. What we have realized is that even if we took this, uh, uh, we performed this test in different position of the tendons because we wanted also to investigate the loss of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the stress because of the, uh, of the curvature, for example, of the tendons. And even if we perform tests in this different position, the coefficient of variation of this, of this uh, test was not uh, very high, was... Uh, about 16%, so a, a low value. Uh, the, um, the beam is, uh, as each beam has five tendons, as you can see in this slide. And uh, there are uh, four uh, anchoring plates at the edge of, this, uh, uh, of the beam, from one side to the other side, while there are some uh, anchorage plates also uh, far from the edge in uh, an internal position. You can see here that of tendon number four and tendon number five. Each tendon was uh, post tension only from one side. So each tendon has a dead anchorage uh, in, from, on one side and the active anchorage on the other side. However, the anchorage plate internal, the internal anchorage plate was in any case for tendon number four and for tendon number five, uh, dead anchorage uh, plates. So numerical analysis. Uh, we performed uh, three different numerical analysis because in general, when we perform numerical analysis, we perform different analysis because we want, we use different analysis to catch different aspects or to go uh, into detail of previous analysis. So, so we perform some global analysis on the deck, uh, shear, I mean shear bending analysis and shear bending verification by uh, using the very simple assumption of, the, uh, of Bernoulli, so um, uh, plain section, the assumption of plain se section. Then we perform some deterministic analysis at the anchorage zone, and then we perform some probabilistic analysis also at the anchorage zone. 
Let's start with the global analysis, shear and bending, very simple by using the Bernoulli's uh, assumption. Uh, we analyze the beam uh, in different uh, configuration. In the first case, we analyze the beam as intact. So without any cut, without any hole in this original uh, configuration before the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, work because uh, for necessary for the demolition by using explosive. Then we analyze the beam in other configuration with reference to the cut and with reference to the holes. Uh, we included two different configurations for the cuts because the length of the cuts was different in, in different cases. So we, we include a configuration called heavy when the, where the left part of the, of the flange was uh, 20 centimeter long, 21 centimeter long. And the configuration called slide where the, the, the part, the remain part of the uh, flange was 35 centimeter long. This is, this where the limit case is that we have uh, understood by making surveys in all the viaduct, in all the viaduct. Then we have uh, make this analysis by including the hole or not including the holes. We only include why, uh, why one hole. So we didn't include the different holes, but we include only one hole and uh, only one hole. And we didn't include the cut of the tendon because we wanted at the first step, we wanted to understand if in this configuration there were or not the safety margin. Uh, since uh, we better analyzed the, the results of the test performs the detention test performed on the on the wires, and uh, by using this uh, back analysis that was made according to Eurocode two, the current Eurocode two, we realized that the active strengths at the uh, at the active anchorage zone was something in between. Uh, 850 megapascal and 900 uh, megapascal. So we perform analysis, the analysis in both these limit cases. By using this very simple uh, analysis, this is a simple support beam, uh, uh, depending, and we perform in this different condition and for different beams because the number of the tendons was different passing from the edge beam to the internal beam. We realized that the safety factor, there was the ratio between the capacity and the demand in shear and in bending was in any case greater than one, starting from was about three for intact girders and uh, up to 1.3, 1.4 in the worst scenario. That was the, the, the heavy, the cut with the, uh, with the heavy flange, uh, the girders with the heavy flange cut and with holes. So after this very simple analysis, we realized that the problem was not in the global uh, behavior, bending and shear behavior of the beam, but maybe was relevant to something occurred at the anchorage. So we moved to the analysis of what occurred at, at the anchorage. So you can see on the right hand side of this picture, the anchorages at the top is the, what we call the dead end. And uh, at the bottom is the active where, where the stress was applying, applied during construction. The total number of the wires per each tendon was uh, from, uh, uh, depending on the case was, uh, uh, 32 in some cases, up to 44 in some other cases. Uh, to consider the uh, application of the force at the anchorage zone, uh, we assume a spread, an inclination of the spread of the acting force according to the current Eurocode 2. Moreover, moreover, we consider also the effect of the cuts on the spread of this acting, acting force. So we made these uh, uh, 3D uh, models in CAD 
to include the effect considering the inclination of the spread. This is an example for the dead head of uh, tendon num number four. And also, yes, and we include another action because we have to consider that the inclination of the tendons applies to different forces. The force, if you see the top of this slide, for the horizontal force, that is F, and also the vertical force. So we applied in the model that we made, in the final element model, the uh, forces F, but we also apply, you can see in the, at the bottom of this slide, the force that we called H. The force num uh, called H arises because of the deviation from the application force to the support of the vertical component of the active stress T. This is an additional force that should be included in our, in our model. This is the, uh, these are some pictures of the finite element models that uh, we use to evaluate the effect of the anchor plates at the end of the girder and the effect of the permanent loads not borne by the tendons because we have to consider that some of the permanent loads could be bear uh, by the tendon uh, but, uh, because of the curvature of, of the tendons itself. So we perform some, this analysis at the, in, in correspondence of the, of the anchorage zone. And what we mm. have discovered that with reference to the dead end of tendon number four, the safety factor <laughs> was... In uh, uh, the the The... The, with reference to the dead dead of tendon number four, and it was the result was very similar also for the dead dead of tendon number five. The safety factor was greater than one, also only in case of assuming an intact girder that we we knew from the site that it was it was not the case. But in all other cases. The, the safety factor for both the edge girders and the central girder was lower than one uh, with the lowest value that was uh, about uh, 0.5. Uh, so according to us, this was the case of the trigger of collapse. The trigger of collapse was, was caused by the reduction in strength near the, the anchorage zone because of the cuts of the, of the flanges. We also perform to better understand in terms of, of probability, probability of failure. Sorry, I, I have some noises. Maybe someone has the microphone open. Just it's one moment. A... Go ahead, sir. Can you kindly mute? Uh, Ravindra, kindly mute Ravindra. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, so we perform some probabilistic analysis at the anchor zone in the same assumption of the deterministic analysis. We assume random variables for the pre-stressing because we had some tests and so we could evaluate from a statistical point of view the effect of pre-stressing and for concrete strength. And by using this analysis, we, we obtain that the, the probability of failure of the dead end of tender number four was very, uh, was, uh, um, uh, we obtained very high values uh, that were not consistent with the probability of failures included uh, at present in the code. However, uh, we have to consider that in the worst scenario, the probability of failure was about 90, 99% in the worst scenario. So for sure, uh, according to us, uh, this was also from a probabilistic point of view, the cause of the collapse. But we have the, the next step, uh, step was to understand what was the cause of the propagation of the failure. And we can, we could understand the cause of the propagation of failure by, by using these two simple stratum time models. In the, this, these are two alternative models. Let's see the, the first one, model number one in the left hand side of this slide. In the, in the model number one, we have the dead end of tendon number four, where the, the total 
pre-stressing action F is applied, because of the first failure, this uh, action F should deviate around the part where the first crack occurs. And this deviation, according to my model number one, caused an increase on the compressive action in the side called CD, and caused also a uh, tensile action in the side called HL and the other transversal side BH and EL. So according to us, the increase in the compressive stress in the uh, side CD is the cause of the propagation of failure. However, if you use another model, similar alternative model, we have this, the, the same result. In model number two, the difference is that the deviation of force pre-stressing action F is compensated by the, a part called N star of the pre-stress action coming from the other tendon. But the result is similar because also in this case, we have the increase of the, uh, of the stress in CD. In fact, this, this, the acting force in CD is the, the, the sum of F plus N star. So this is the cause of the propagation. And according to this model, the propagation of, of the first crack it should be almost vertical with a very slight inclination. So collapse stages. According to us, uh, maybe the drilling machine was making some holes. We don't know if uh, the holes uh, in that moment, the, 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 holes, uh, the, the worker were, ma uh, were making some holes near the, the, the position where the first cracks occur or far from that, but for sure uh, the, the worker was making some holes. But according to our uh, assumption, our consideration, the first crack occurred on the left part of the, of the beam, maybe in the, in the edge beams, but could be also in some of the internal, internal beams. The first crack propagate almost vertically and to the entire transversal section of the beam and of the entire deck, because the other guard has not the possibility to withstand the load of the first of the first beam that collapsed. So there was a progressive collapse that involved the entire deck with this movement and this light rotation. And that at the impact, the 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 half of the of the deck was destroyed and there was a rotation uh, towards column number 13 with the crash of the guard in the column number 13. According to us, we had also two confirmation of the assumed scenario of the collapse. The first confirmation is, is given by the uh, beam of the first span, the span number 19, that we use for some tests. You can see here the beam when all, where all the flanges were removed and some uh, demolition works were made by using an hydro jet, so an hydro demolition. Uh, at first, it was removed only the concrete cover to make some measurement about uh, the position of the tendons, the spacing of the, of the steel reinforcement, etc. And after the uh, contractor decided where there was not uh, the necessity anymore to perform some tests on this beam, the contractor decided to complete the demolition of this beam by using the hydro jack. Du during this uh, uh, demolition work, uh, immediately the beam collapse uh, and the collapse starting, you can see from the dead end of tendon number four. You can see clearly in the, uh, in the picture at the uh, right bottom of this slide. And you can see also clearly in the picture of, at the uh, left bottom of this slide that the, the crack started from the anchorage zone and propagate almost vert uh, uh, vertically as, uh, as the result of our assumptions. Another investigation, another, sorry, another confirmation was made on another beam of the first, of the first uh, span. Uh, the contractor decided to remove 
this beam from the original uh, position in order to perform some proof load test. And so the contractor made some holes to simulate the holes for the explosive and also make some, made some transversal cut. Uh, according to us, uh, this, uh, even if the, uh, the beam survived from the, uh, from the test, uh, this is not a proof that the beams had the uh, possibility to survive from the uh, pre-demolition operation because uh, there was not consistency between the uh, cut made in this beam and the holes made in this beam and those made in the other uh, in the other beam. You can see here that the cuts were made. Let's have a look at the uh, bottom right uh, slide uh, picture. You can see here that the cuts were made almost perfectly by using a saw. By in the other cases, uh, the cuts were made, they were not perfect, and they were by using an excavator. So the configuration was, was completely different. But however, it's not important in this case to uh, demonstrate if the proof loss was, uh, was sufficient to demonstrate the collapse or not. What is important with reference to, to what I'm going to say is that after the proof load was made and after that the concrete cover was slightly removed to perform, to make some measurement of the, of the, of the layout of the tendons and of the spacing of the bar, the contractor started to make uh, the demolition by using this uh, uh, excavator that you can see in the right hand side uh, picture. And when the excavator was working not on the right hand side, on the right part of this beam, but on the left part of this beam, a collapse occurred in this beam in the right part, exactly starting, you can see clearly in the slide at the bottom of the bottom right of this. Uh, slide starting again from the dead end of tendon number four, four and this uh, failure this crack propagate almost vertically up to the entire transversal section of this girdle so again according to us this was a clear confirmation of the uh, scenario that we have assumed as the result of our investigation uh, to conclude, I would like to highlight that, uh, uh, because I, I haven't said before, that uh, there was a uh, detailed design of the pre of the of the this girder in the configuration immediately before the demolition by using explo explosive. I mean, no one has performed uh, global or detailed analysis of the beam in the configuration where some cuts and so on were, uh, were made. So there was a completely lack of the design, demolition design. There were only some drawings with reference of the position, but they were qualitative drawing with reference of the position of, this, uh, of the holes. And you know, uh, with reference to the cuts, uh, there was no design at all, but uh, the, the technical uh, manager of the uh, demolition uh, subcontractor decided inside where these cuts were to be made. So without making any calculation, global or detailed calculation. So according to us, this was our uh, the main problems with reference to the this uh, this uh, collapse moreover uh, one question is that why uh, since uh, some uh, similar demolition works occurred in other viaducts because uh, the renovation works uh, included not only this viaduct but many other viaducts in the motorway why this was the only why that suffered from a collapse because uh, this was the most peculiar one, according to us. In fact, the other viaduct, uh, all the other viaduct, had as a deck a I-shaped beams, not a T-shaped beams, with a slab above them. So the cuts were performed not in the I-shaped beams, but in the slab above them. 
On the other, uh, conversely, in this case, there was no slab and the, the beams were, were damaged do, during this cut, uh, cutting operation because the cuts were performed in, this, uh, in the top range of this beam. So with this, uh, I have completed my presentation and I thank all uh, for, for, uh, for everything. So if there are some uh, question, I will be glad to answer uh, the question. Thank you, Fabrizio. That was a very interesting presentation you gave us on two collapses, which and the manner in which you go about investigating them in Italy may be quite different from what we do here. And the level of detail to which you went in the second example was even more interesting to realize the different types of analysis for the different situations. But the most important thing as a forensic engineer, which you brought out today, I think for all of us to learn is that first of all, you've got to appoint, it, it's the same that happened with the first, uh, I think it was the Tay Bridge which collapsed, the railway Tay Bridge which collapsed. I'm not, I, I don't remember the exact name, the British one in which the steam train, uh, you know, it, it collapsed. And that one taught us uh, the, the, the origins of forensic engineering. That is, first of all, you appoint an officer who's given the right and authority to investigate in some format, a captain of the job, as you like. The second yeah. is that you have to understand the root cause of the issue by ruling out various other uh, matters that might be possibilities. So you look at the whole set of possibilities and then you come down to a narrow subset and lock in on the remainder possibilities. The third that you brought out is the detail of investigation which you have to go through to create, recreate the failure event. You have to re, you have to postulate how it, the cause, then you have to be able to recreate the failure event based upon the debris, based upon your analysis, based upon your photo study or the laser scanner that you use, for example, here. Those measurements and those insights tell us how we have reconstructed our postulate uh, and we reconceived, as you like, the failure event. So these are the ways in which the forensic engineer progresses. Today, he has many tools at his, dis at his disposal, like you have uh, your laser scanner, uh, 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 which, which is amazing for displacement and directions and alignment checks on the collapse mode and postulating the modes of failure, et cetera, from the laser scanner survey that you showed us. And also the levels of analysis, the deterministic, which analysis appropriate for what situation and when to invoke that rationally that also you have shown us. And very interestingly, you showed us how you take away the surface of the concrete with a hydro demolition tool to expose, yeah. the, expose the cable below and then ascertain exactly its uh, profile and then uh, reconstruct uh, based upon your postulate the failure event and how far the contractor was probably asked to go to show that that was, you know, the postulate had to be tested on a span taken out of the bridge. Uh, I think these are all very important uh, lessons for us to have seen and to learn from. And the manner in which you said that there was an expert evidence, you were an expert evident evidence in the first case. And in the second case, you were appointed by the prosecutor judge, that's the authority itself. So on the one hand, you're an expert witness in the first case. And on the other hand, you're appointed by the local, by the authority, the, the, the authority, the judge or the prosecutor's office, if, if you would so say. So these are all very interesting things for us. Uh, the, the way we go about it is uh, quite different in India. We have, if an event happens and there's death due to negligence, then we have a criminal procedure code in which you, know, uh, you, you have to prove your innocence more or less. And the other is the civil procedure code. If there is no death, the event is treated as a civil procedure for which they both are written codes which apply in India and the nature of investigations. One is criminal police, et cetera and the district magistrate and you know that kind of approach. The other is the civil procedure court with the civil courts and, and, and things like that, where you appoint lawyers or you have experts and things like that. Frequently, we get called out in this country, people like Vinay and Alok and myself and others, so many of us here and Venkat probably, and I see so many of the participants who are all experts in bridge engineering who get called out to investigate. What is needed in our country today is, I would say, based upon what you showed us, is a more formalization of the process of forensic engineering. A formal approach, uh, some written guidance and documents, and a, a, a kind of a, a, a scientific and technical way to go about and document failure events so that we can learn from failures in the future. 
so that we can uh, learn and prevent these from happening again. At the end of the day, that's what forensic engineering is all about. Learning from failures or part failures and developing changes in codes, procedures, materials, what have you, or welding techniques, what have you, to show that these, to prevent these uh, kind of things from happening again. So I, I thank you for this wonderful presentation. And I would like uh, Vinay Gupta to say a few words, our president to say a few words before we take questions from the audience. Mm, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fabrizio. Uh, it's coming from the bottom of my heart. The kind of presentation you have made, you have really walked us through the uh, structures. And that is what is really needed, uh, you know, to have a, a sort of a presentation which goes into the uh, minds. And you've done it very rightly. And of course, we know that Dr. Hashwadan Sobarav is, uh, I mean, has narrated that very well as to whatever you explained. And uh, we also have the president of Indian Association of Structural Engineering, Mr. Alok Bhamek, if he likes to say a few words. Of course, it's our common field. We were together in the morning also today. And we are also doing certain investigations in some way or the other. But they are limited only to more of a desktop work. And all the field work is done by other agencies, inputs given to us. But uh, anyway, Mr. Alok, anything that you would like to add? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Vinay. Wonderful. For giving me this opportunity. And uh, what a fascinating lecture from Fabrizio. Thank you, Fabrizio. I mean, it was really uh, a great honor to be here to listen to this two failure scenarios which you have uh, we have presented to us. Uh, there was one commonality in both. In both the cases, you presented the investigation of a situation where either a demolition work was going on or a, a repair work was uh, taking place. So both the failures demonstrated one thing that there was a uh, some human negligence uh, during the repair work or demolition work. And um, I, uh, what I, the takeaway, some of the takeaways which I have noted, you mentioned that in Italy, whatever may be the, uh, I mean the whether the collapse uh, involves some death or not, it is considered as a criminal offence and investigation yeah. proceeds on the criminal lines rather than on a civil procedure code. And that shows yeah. how much importance is given to the structural uh, safety. Uh, one thing I just wanted to ask you, Fabrizio, uh, that, uh, you know, in the second uh, case, uh, which, you, uh, which you mentioned about this demolition, and you mentioned very clearly that there was no demolition design, so to say, and the subcontractor simply did it. Now, is that, uh, I mean, in terms of the procedures that is normally followed in Italy, is this, is the, was this supposed to be done? That means, was there any uh, sort of uh, negligence also on the part of authorities not to ask for such demolition plan uh, before they actually proceed for demolition? And second uh, question in general, in both these cases, what, uh, was there any lessons learned on the professional code of ethics that is violated and whether uh, we, whether, you know, in Italy, there were some, some uh, ch changes in the policy in terms of, you know, what, uh, what is needed to be done in future. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with reference to the, the first question, uh, no, no, the, this is not the habit because uh, uh, the, according to Italian law, we have many steps of control. So a, a demolition uh, and a preliminary and detailed uh, demolition design should be included in the overall design. So in fact, we were very, very surprised, not only us as a, a consultant of the, of the public prosecutor, but also the other ex ex expert witness, we, when we have realized that there was no design with reference to the pre-demolition configuration. This was completely missing. And the other strange thing is that this was not uh, understood from all the people involved in the controls during the entire process, from the very preliminary design 
to the construction design. This is why at present the trial is, the crime trial has not started yet, but at present there are 14 investigated people for this, uh, for this collapse. And most of them are people uh, involved in the control or in the check of the design. So this, is, this was very strange to us. It's not what it should be in Italy. And uh, with reference to the, 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 the other thing, the policy, uh, we, uh, these are, uh, for, for, uh, fortunately, these are uh, single cases that occur very, very rarely because we have uh, in Italy many uh, steps of checks, uh, etc. So if the overall procedure works well, we are able to uh, find an error, a human error in the in the in the step or in intermediate step of the of the of the design. So there was no important echo in the in the I mean in the update of standard or of law with reference to this uh, this uh, these two collapses. One important uh, thing uh, with reference to the first collapse. Uh, uh, and that is also at present under uh, discussion, uh, it was that the uplift was made with the complete traffic under the bridge. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and in fact, two people were killed, not because of the collapse of the bridge, because the, the car crashed into the, into the collapsed bridge. So there is a, dis the, 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 a discussion and more of the technician of engineers are asking for, uh, for stopping during the uplift operation, the traffic underneath the bridge uh, until the, the bridge, the deck is in the final and safe configuration. This is what we, we the, the, our politicians are studying to include or not in the new in the new and future standards. Thank you, thank Wonderful. you, Fabrizio. I Thanks just wanted to Thank mention. You, I just wanted to also add that you know, I uh, today I remember Robert Rate. Uh, in 2016 in Stockholm IABAC, I had the opportunity to attend the workshop okay. organized by Robert. Rate and I ah. think you were also one of the uh, yeah, faculty. Yeah, the lectures. And I had the privilege to attend to that workshop. What a fascinating one. And I miss Robert Rate today. Yeah, yeah, I miss too. It was a, it was a friend and a, and a mentor to, to and me. To all of us. He, yeah, to and if, if uh, Harsha, if you remember, yeah. during that Stockholm, you have say we all persuaded Robert to Rate, come to India, yeah. Come to India and give a workshop. In now India. he's no more, but Fabrizio is uh, Fabrizio's holding up the flag of our yes. TG 5.1 on that score, and we'll have more interactions. Yes, yes. TG 5.1 is a really fascinating group, and the founder was Robert Rate, whom we missed dearly. No. But we also lost a very another very famous Milos Dadaki, another excellent engineer, super engineer, right. and and you know we've had. Uh, our ups and downs, but uh, the, the team goes on and uh, there's wonderful work being done by this team, including uh, a, a full worldwide survey, which will shortly be produced of the various bridge failures and the statistical analysis of the causes, etc., of different types all over the world, actually. So they have a big database and there's something similar, which is being done for performance based uh, drawing out performance based specs by Sykoff. Uh, I think is that the way you say his name Sykoff, right? Uh, Professor Dr. Sykrov from Russia. Hey, Sarkov, yeah. Sarkov, from 1.5, TG 1.5. Both fascinating groups. Are, and they're all open to membership. They're all open to uh, you all joining and adding. And uh, look, uh, people like you, Vinay, and all have so much. Uh, Ravindra have so much to add to this. Vinay, Venkat, and all have so much to add to these uh, groups. Yeah? So uh, let's take a question. Um, Sukha. Sukalyana Sarkar asks, sir, if scanning was done before drilling operation, then multiple drilling at the same location due to encountering tendons could have been avoided. The same note, did you not use a GPR? I'm just adding that. Uh, could we not have detected the location of those cables prior to drilling? No, no, because it was difficult because of the height of the, of the, of the deck. It was uh, because there was the necessity to put some temporary scaffoldings, et cetera, to, to detect the, 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 the position of the tendons. 
And so what they did is was just starting the drilling operation and stopping where something harder was 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 detected. Right. So it so, was a trial and error type situation, which hopefully could have been avoided uh, with some method of detection. There are yeah, 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 yeah. But 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 also also by using a, a, a appropriate drilling machine because it, the, there are some drilling machines that stop immediately. Uh, when some uh, something harder is detected, this drilling machine, because it was used, is mainly used for rock ex excavation, had not the possibility to stop. So it was left to the practice of the ability of the workers to stop or not. Right. Uh, let's take another question. Uh, are these cases available for studying purposes for master students in detail? A gentleman called Mr. Madhav Purohit asks. The, the point really is in, in India, failures of structures are not taught, except for a couple mm. of places at the master's level. It, failure, learning from failures of failure, uh, failure of structures is hardly taught. And this important part is missing in the educational uh, getup itself. So the idea is, uh, you know, he's asking, do you think case studies like this could be provided to master students so that they could learn? We could look at this at uh, TG 5.1 and structure some case studies and record them and give them to any university or, you know, whoever wants to learn from, I think we could, uh, just a thought, we could develop, say, some 15 case study series of buildings, bridges, et cetera, and document yeah. them, package them and give them to universities so that they could use the taught knowledge and we could then take queries if any queries came up, written queries or something. Yeah, yeah, you should. 5 yeah. Yeah, no. yeah, sure. 5.1. Yeah, yeah, sure. And, uh, and I, I would like to add that uh, uh, also, you know, we are proposing a bulletin in IABS uh, with reference to case, uh, to case study that could be, could be useful. In Italy, in Italy uh, there is a, a master course of the University of Naples with reference to forensic engineering. And, but there are mainly uh, continuing education course uh, in, in Italy with reference to failures and collapses. So there is a, a wide uh, education, uh, wide, many education courses on collapses, but not mainly on, not in, at the university, mainly on con, post-education, post-continuing continue education courses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some more questions maybe? Uh, Sunil Khand asks, what would it take to achieve professional certification in India? Alok, we know all of your antennas on. What would it take to achieve professional certification in India? B Rao, BSC Rao, you're also here in India. Formalizing the expertise gained due to qualification plus experience in a qualification plus experience, get you a professional certification for forensic engineering or bridge re rehabilitation, like say a chartered engineer in the UK. You know, is there... Where in the world, or where, what would you, uh, what are your insights yeah. as to well, formalizing I, this? If I may yeah, uh, look, answer this question. Because you quite see, a big engineering lobby is fighting for this uh, engineer's bill, which is to certify the engineers. But Mr. Alok Bhami can say more about it. Go ahead, Alok. Yeah, you see, uh, forensic uh, structural engineering is still an evolving subject in India. It is, uh, it is yet to, uh, you know, take shape. There are very few number of colleges in India where this particular subject is taught. And uh, by the way, I am a faculty of uh, one of, you know, the college in Vijayawada, um, Sharada Engineering College, where this forensic structural engineering is being taught. And uh, only recently I have started out their request, uh, taking a few classes. But this is a very nascent stage. And it will take a long time for us to really grow uh, on this subject. And basically, basically, I would quote here, you know, Robert Rate. Uh, I remember, uh, I think uh, I would recommend all of you to get his book, a handbook on forensic structural engineering, where he says that the vulnerable structure of the late 20th century will provide bread and butter to the forensic engineer of the 21st century. I think this one sentence speaks volumes because what we see today, a uh, series of collapses, we have seen the frequency of collapses have increased. And uh, we can understand the reason because 
the rate of progress by which in the in, in the infrastructure sector in india and uh, we have seen number of failures in last six months i have seen six failures uh, on bridges alone uh, close to us vinay is aware of that <laughs> so so actually this is one subject which is evolving and i think uh, there is going to be a huge demand for forensic structural engineer and uh, uh, you know if you are not being taught forensic structural engineering in your uh, colleges no problem in the practice also you know you keep your ears eyes open and investigation if you participate in investigation you can do self learning and associations like ours indian association of structural engineers indian institute of bridge engineers will provide platform for you uh, where you know uh, webinars like this or refresher courses or workshops will be organized in times to come on the subject of forensic structural engineering which will give you uh, some but finally a lot of self learning will be required uh, but i think this is an evolving profession and it will have a huge demand in times to come there's a there's a comment by dr mirul wakil sir national forensic science university also offers two year mtech course master level course in forensic structural engineering in india so that's a interesting point uh, dr wakil makes um so what happened if the bearings collapsed bearings uh, what happened to the bearings during collapse any study carried out on collapse bearing that is post mortem of the bearings themselves dr pal dr nc pal is asking uh, the, uh, the the bearings the, during collapse uh, which yeah, what case what was the study uh, done on the bearings themselves you know material distortions uh, the, 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 the ah, kind the, of uh, I think up and he, the capacities etc yeah yeah he make he make reference to the to the maybe to the first case yeah. the first case where I'm, uh yes uh, il, the, the the problem was that as i said that uh, the they had no capacity uh, no lateral strength at all uh, and uh, this was clearly showed uh, by the test performed at the university of ancora by the the uh, the consultant of the public prosecutor office also some uh, chemical and other tests were performed but the main problem was that there was no connection between the bearings they were only rubber bearings without any steel elements and uh, moreover all the other part uh, or the other element put above the the column the temporary columns were not con connected one to the other so everything was left to the friction that was very low because it's still too steel and moreover uh, the laser scanner survey has revealed also that there was uh, most likely there was not uh, a perfect uh, vertical position of the deck above the bearing so there was a slight eccentricity this is why the consultant performed also the test with the, the small eccentricity Uh, however, uh, the, the trigger collapse, according to us, was the buckling of a steel element, as you uh, can see. And according to the consultant, the public prosecutor was a general instability of this kind of uh, summation of this, uh, the, this element. For sure, for sure, the, uh, for sure and, uh, not considering the trigger of collapse, the, the main cause of the collapse was that there was no capacity to uh to lateral forces or to lateral movement slight lateral movement that occurred during the uplift operation i have to highlight also that in another bridge uh, because this this case uh, this uplift was one out uh, i think out of three or five bridges to be uplifted uh, same bridges same operation and same everything in the in the previous one it, i think it was in second in the previous one after the uplift they have really, uh, they have uh, measured a lateral movement of some centimeters so it was clear that the uplift was not completely vertical but some lateral movements of course also during the uplift right right there's a there's a question asked by varad danoka in the second example would there have been a better solution for demolition of the concrete spans i mean why oh, have okay. done what they did could some other thing have been thought of 
Yeah, uh, in the, there is a, a preliminary document, uh, but one page, not more, one, two pages, not more, in which the uh, contractor in the preliminary decide, uh, described the reason why they, 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 they have chosen the demolition with explosive. But to be honest, the main uh, reason, it, it was the high of the bridge, up to 200, from zero to, uh, to 200, um, not 200, but to 100, because it was only relevant to the concrete part, 100 meters. And uh, the demolition by using explosive was the quickest and, uh, and, uh, and the cheapest. So they decided to do that. But however, uh, it was possible to do that by using explosive. The only thing that it was needed was to, uh, to understand the safety factor before the, 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 the explosion in order to work safely. And the other thing that should be accepted was the possibility that during the collapse, some slight movement during the, the vertical movement could occur. So there was the possibility that this part of the deck could crash into the, the pier. This is why, some uh, after this collapse, uh, some uh, some uh, uh, the, the demolition co was completed by using explosive, but without uh, cutting in this mm -hmm. uh, huge way the all the with the slight cuts. And what was put were there some uh, were there some barriers were put uh, around the piers. And in fact, in some cases, in one case, the deck collapsed and crashed into the barriers without damaging the pier, but only damages the still temporary barrier. So it was possible to demolish the, the, the bridge by using explosive, but for sure some analysis were, were needed. Right. I, can I ask you to unmute someone I want from the audience to speak? BSC Rao, can you unmute BSC Rao, please? From the participants, BSC Rao, he's from the Association of Consulting Civil Engineers. And every now and a few years, they have an event at which Robert Ratte, Jonathan Wood, uh, and all have come and spoken. Uh, I've attended one before. So you would see. Uh, uh, can I have uh, BSC Rao, two minutes, please? Yeah, good evening. Good evening to everybody. Yeah. Thank you, uh, thank you Asha. Uh, uh, Professor Dr. Fabrizio, it was a wonderful. Uh, lecture that you gave covering all aspects of forensic civil engineering. I think you covered it very wonderfully. What I just wanted to say, thank you for the opportunity, Harsha, for uh, giving me this Welcome. opportunity. What I really wanted to say was that uh, uh, in 2013, I, I organized the first forensic civil engineering conference, as you know. And subsequently, again, in 2016, uh, we organized a second international conference. What is happening is that uh, in th somebody asked the question about uh, how you get certified in India. Uh, as uh, I think uh, Mr. Alok Bhomik has already said, you, there's no particular uh, method of getting uh, certified yet in this country, and you have to train yourself. But the important thing is that uh, what I feel very, very pleased about personally is that after the first forensic conference that we had in 2013, organized by the Association of Consulting Civil Engineers when I was the president at that time, uh, subsequent to that, and subsequent to the 2016 conference, there are about eight or nine universities and colleges in India which are offering uh, M-Tech elective courses or complete M uh, masters in uh, forensic civil engineering. Gujarat State Forensic Sciences Institute is one that gives you a two-year master's course. And there are several other colleges and universities which are offering electives in the master's course in forensic civil engineering, which I think is a very, very big step forward. In fact, here I must uh, remember uh, Dr. Sunil Kute, Professor Sunil Kute of uh, the University of Pune, who actually took the conference proceedings of the first conference and used that as a syllabus for the elective in the masters. So I think it's a very big thing that's happening in India today that universities are recognizing the importance of forensic civil engineering and the fact that so many conferences are now being arranged, which has given a lot of publicity and uh, you know uh, attention to this particular a very exciting field. So that's all that I wanted to say. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for people to learn from these conferences. And incidentally, the Association of Concerned Civil Engineers is also planning to have the third international conference next year. Sometime later next year, we had to postpone it from August of this year because of the pandemic. But uh, we will uh, have the third conference 
and i had invited dr rate also previously but he was unable to come and harsha as you know probably we have invited quite a few yeah. uh, experts from overseas uh, to take part in fact we uh, called dr gopal rai also last time yeah. and unfortunately he was unable to come at that time he had a personal problem uh, i think uh, we there's one opportunity where you get to see uh, a large number of very very experienced people who will come and share their knowledge and i think for the younger group it's a it's an exciting uh, forum to uh, have this and now there are also websites that are available i i run two uh, i run a whatsapp group as well as a facebook group as you know and that has got a lot of attention so thank you very much indeed thank you thank you vc rao thank, thank you, you so much uh thank you so much for those insights and those comments and those suggestions and the the fact that various uh, institutions have picked up on uh, uh the foreign sec engineering uh, teaching as well as uh, uh masters level and electives so that's very heartening to note on that note uh, let me uh, uh call upon uh, our president had to leave uh, i had another meeting at 7 fabrizio we have stretched time is indian elastic time so you have to bear with us for a few more minutes uh, can i ask uh, gopal rai to uh, to then uh, officiate in on behalf of vinay gupta and to give a few remarks and then uh, uh, propose uh, Uh, Gopal, to give a vote of thanks. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, before I give a formal vote of thanks, uh, our secretary uh, Sopnil is there, General Secretary, Honorable Secretary. Sopnil, can we? Uh, I have just uh, like as you work extensively on beam. Can we yeah. use uh, a beam facility from the forensic investigation and whether? Whether such thing has been practiced, uh, or we can ask uh, uh, Fabrizio also, Dr. Fabrizio is also, that uh, whether uh, these things can be uh, take these tools can be used for the investigation in future. I, I don't want the the failures to come, but in in case it it goes, what do you suppose? Uh, uh, yeah, Gopal, my voice is clear. Clear. Yeah, it is clear. Audible. Clear. hello yeah go ahead yeah, yeah it is clear yeah. so yeah so really uh, the beam can be used but it, it the thought has to be given in a way like normal process what we do is once the uh, you know during the construction phase we make the modeling part uh, up to the 0 0 based on the drawings and post that we have an as built modeling done uh, you know once the construction is being completed so uh, that as built model can be used say in any uh, you know kind of an collapse or any any kind of an accident has taken place or something of that sort that model can be very much can be used for the further forensic study uh, the asbit model so that has to be practiced but but we have uh, that is not being done as of now as per my knowledge using the 3d model the existing asbit model but definitely it can be taken up to the next level post asbit model for which you need a full digital twin Yes. We need to create a full digital twin. Yes. We are some way away yet. Yes. But let's see. Anyway, that's neither here. Yeah, nor but that yet. can be no. used. Definitely, it is possible. Yeah. It is being done. Uh, Sopnil, for the few audience, can you uh, tell about as Sopnil is uh, like he is a founder of Intendo uh, Associate and he is working in project planning and all for the huge projects. Can you brief about uh, a little liner for Beam? Uh, what is the benefit of Beam? Otherwise, all will consider Beam means B E A M. And yeah. they will consider flexible and share. All right. So right. can we elaborate on that part? Yes. Two so minutes, and then we close. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Beam is basically as a evolving concept, but uh, we have been doing it uh, since I was studied in UK. There we have uh, started working on BIM in 2008-9, but now we are extensively using Beam in India also. So uh, for Beam as a concept, uh, which we are dealing in, it starts from the uh, project planning. Uh, then you know taking the 2d models 3d models and then collaborating them together to take it to the 4d 5d and up to seven dimension and uh, so basically you can see your progress as well as as built data on the 3d perspective model uh, with respect to the progress and then we are using bim also to contract this in towards the fit basically is for the claim management and delay analysis experts uh, in, in in that particular field and now as gopal has asked the question this can be further extended to the uh, you know the forensic uh, modeling also basically so this is what mainly it is 
all related to the quantity takeoff, progress monitoring, and claim management using the three D platform. So this is what BIM so, is all about. Anything, Fabrizio? Yeah, yeah. Something, Fabrizio. Can you add, Doctor Fabrizio? Can you add something on that? Uh, I'm not expert in BIM, but uh, I think that this is a very powerful tool that can be used for the, in, in also for ex existing structures in general and also for forensic investigation. Uh, for example, we're starting a task group in uh, Commission 5 with reference to uh, BIM modeling in order to better understand the use of this, uh, these new models on, uh, on existing structure in general. Any uh, Gopal? Uh, yeah. Is it for a vote of thanks? Yes. Uh, uh, let me start the formal vote of thanks. But uh, before I go for a formal vote of thanks, actually after hearing Dr. Fabrizio, uh, 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 I was going through one quote. Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. I was going through one quote that if you do a proper investigation. Okay, and proper forensic uh, detailing and all of any failures. Okay, always people say failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is not the opposite of success. It's part of success. So if we do a proper detailing investigation, then every failure can be, uh, we can save more and more bridges and we can more, more engineering and that part. So we should learn from failure, but unless and until we do proper investigation and, and thorough uh, uh, detailing, then only we'll come to the problem and then we can solve. So let me thank uh, first today's the speaker, uh, Dr. Fabrizio. Uh, thank you. Really thanks. Uh, thanks for your valuable time and really like the detailing which we have went. Okay, each piece and uh, like from the engineering, from the material, from the uh, the analysis part. It, it thoroughly it was uh, like uh, you have you have done a full operation and we are for last one and a half hour we were sitting in the OTP okay operation theater we are sitting and you are investigating the bridges so really salute to you and it's a good to learn the the the, the people how do the forensic engineering let me thanks to Dr Harshvardhan Subarao sir the executive committee of uh, IIB member and he has taken all the pain to invite you. And uh, to like, we are fortunate that we are hearing today, and uh, uh, really, it has changed the uh, approach of forensic engineering. So, I thanks Dr. Harshwadan Subarao sir uh, for taking all the all the all the pain and all the liberty to invite and uh, do all the like engineering way and doing the monitoring for this uh, lecture series number ten. Let me thanks to our director general uh, Dupte sir for. Uh, giving the, the opportunity and all the freedom so that we can go more and more uh, for the IIB betterment. Our president, just Vinay Gupta, has left. Uh, he was having another meeting, but he has given good regards to the today's speaker that uh, he has changed the approach of the uh, forensic engineering. So that's uh, the, the best part. And he has given a good regards on behalf of IIB. Let me thanks to Sopnil, uh, who has Another uh, approach that how we can the beam part into the, the forensic engineering. And thanks all the executive committee, uh, the members and all IIB members, all the delegates and all the, the participants who have today attended the uh, today's uh, lecture series uh, 10. And we look for, for uh, lecture series 11. And before that, let me thanks to Rui Agrawal, Deepika Singh and all the office bearers who, who help us and Josefa, who's controlling all the, uh, uh, the the web series and all that part. So uh, let me thanks. And here we conclude with the permission of Dr. Hanzan Subara. Shall we Absolutely. conclude uh, today's... Uh, uh, thank you very much. And here we conclude. Just one, just one, one, one word, you. last word, if I may. I want to thank Alok and BSC Rao, their expertise, and Vinay Gupta, their expertise in this area in India are, 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 are well known. Ravindra Goel is with Bridges. He didn't speak today much, but I, I, his expertise is legendary too in this area of uh, failure investigations. And from the, uh, from the academia, Professor Jyoti Bushari is there who I think now will take on this uh, forensic engineering to, uh, in her institute and try and do something yeah. with all of us are experts yeah. in this area and we are prepared to help you in some manner or the other. So, Dr. Harsha, can I just put one minute? Please go ahead. 
yeah actually i take a pride that uh, in our institute at uh, pg level that is me we are running this particular uh, me structure course in which we are i am offering this particular elective and i am teaching the student this particular subject of forensic engineering so as you said that uh, we actually find a lack of the case studies the detailed case studies and the what uh, because there are not much uh, textbooks or uh, reference books which are specifically devoted for this particular subject so we mostly rely on the google and the other case studies which have been described in the research papers for uh, giving the insight to the students for this so as you said with uh, fabrizio and yourself if you are making some compilation of some failure case study that would be a very good uh, what you can say assimilation of this particular work if it can be transferred to the academic institution it will be very worth worthy i just thought of the i just thought out of the box madam yeah but, but that to, is a very good suggestion that has come up and <laughs> Uh, uh, on the behalf of all the academic mm -hmm. institution who, who are offering this particular courses, it will. We run a workshop. Alok, yeah, Alok has attended the workshop. I mean, we all teach or we are all part of the workshop. We developed the course curriculum some years ago, so there is yeah. a formal course that IABC gives, uh, which is quite good, and I think we will augment it with some case study type situations, further case study type situation for academia. and try and yeah. build up something the point here is we don't have much documented in india there's a reluctance to document any yes that is what we find the it's a kind of a blame game we yeah, do they, find the failures but the investigations a, yeah the point is nobody wants to be blamed and everybody wants yeah. to hide and the nature <laughs> That's the main thing. to pick up everyone put them in the kalibush into the jail that kind of attitude <laughs> all these are deterrents to building up an approach to for, you know to forensic engineering and the other part of course is that uh, uh, at least now the taught knowledge would become available but yes. the documented case studies from which we learn or we, we we move ahead that is reluctantly not available in india at all or is available in patchy format and uh, these are the deterrents to developing an india case study based approach at the moment but i hope it will change and we will start to document all our investigations more thoroughly in the future alo right. any last word uh, yeah thank you dr harsha i know that we are late but i i just thought That's just to it. share uh, half a minute that you know two things when we consider that forensic structural engineering will be useful in india and successful only when a post graduate student who has uh, done a post graduation in forensic structural engineer engineering finds a suitable a employment in <laughs> in in the profession of forensic structural engineering yeah. that is not happening yeah. because we do not have consultant who are exclusively expert in forensic structural engineering why is it so because it is an evolving subject and the client really do not you know feel the so far the need to have you know expert forensic structural engineers to be engaged in case of any criminal proceedings or in case of any civil proceedings of bridge collapse or structural collapse i think we have a long way to go but i am sure uh, this uh, this uh, will come in next coming decade i am sure you will find that you know this subject will grow and there will be people there will be consultant who will be working only on forensic structural engineering so fabio i look forward to that but Fabricio. one more important thing i just wanted to mention that you know in indian association of structural engineers we have decided to come out with a compendium on structural failures in india and we are compiling we have uh, identified a team and we are compiling although it is very very difficult to get the real data from the indian bridge or structural collapse and to document it but we are making an attempt and i think in another 5 or 6 months you will get a a book on case studies which may be useful for uh, institutions thank wonderful. you wonderful so fabrizio the idea of bringing you here today was to actually put a needle into everyone to wake up and to yeah, yeah. create this debate about uh, about forensic engineering its need in india how and we relate very easily to bridges because everybody sees the bridge when they drive on it on it or they are you know quite important public structures so failures of these always attract the papers you know everything if a building collapses somewhere a little bit here and there and they hushed up but a bridge failing is a big thing you know it's a big matter matter for everyone and it comes in all the papers so the idea of today's uh, invitation was to raise this debate i now think we have the debate we will go on with these yeah. series of talks 
And of course, from IABSC, we will support any institution from our group that uh, so wants to build up its expertise or its knowledge base or what have you. Just write to IABSC and we will try and provide you the backup. And so will, uh, we will collaborate with IAB or IASTRUCT or whoever it is in this domain. Thanks all. Uh, I, that's from my side, Gopal. Thank you. Thank part. you. Yeah. Really, thanks to. to, to uh, hello, Bhumik sir. And from Shodhan Subara. And this is a subject, like, this is an endless subject because we are learning from something. Okay. So this will go on. And thanks to all the delegates and everyone. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Thanks, thank you, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy your wine. Bye bye. Enjoy your wine. Richly deserved. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Gopal. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gay. Yeah.